This video is part two of analysis of six of the more popular poems from the post-1914 war poetry selection. We've already looked at Who's for the Game, Suicide in the Trenches and Dolce de Coromest, and this one will deal with Anthem for Doom Youth, Disabled and Icarus All Sorts. First up is Anthem for Doom Youth by Wilfred Owen. We've already looked at his biographical details and we know that his poetry is set in World War I. So let's go straight into the purpose of this poem. It highlights the fate of soldiers who die on the battlefield. The themes of the poem are the conditions of war, the death of soldiers, a lack of a proper burial, and the effect of war on those at home. Its tone is questioning, sad, final, and hopeless. The title Anthem for Doom Youth portrays this poem as a song for an entire generation of young men who are doomed to die. Owen constantly asks the question, what kind of funeral do soldiers killed in battle receive? The answer is quite depressing. They don't get one. Instead, Owen replaces the traditional images of a funeral, choirs, flowers, candles, etc., with the sounds and horrors of war. For example, in line one, he asks, what bells ring for the soldiers slaughtered like cattle? None. Only the monstrous anger of the guns. The word monstrous here conveys the horror and violence of artillery fire. Owen uses onomatopoeia to make us hear the crack of rifle fire with stuttering rifles' rapid rattle and patter. The T sound is supposed to sound like bullets, and this sound replaces any quick prayers that would be said for them before they die. Notice the repetition of no and nor to emphasise everything they don't get. Instead of a traditional church choir, the soldiers hear the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells. This description is quite twisted and sinister. And back home, the effect of war continues as bugles call their names from sad shires, which refers to the areas they come from, the bugle, of course, being the instrument which plays the last post on Remembrance Day. Owen asks what candles may be held to speed them all. Again, none. Instead, the soldiers receive the holy glimmers of goodbyes, which means their families have to accept their dead. There follows a play on words, as the pallor or paleness in the faces of their wives and girlfriends replaces a pal, which is a piece of white cloth draped over a coffin at a funeral. No coffin for them, as they are often left to rot on the battlefield. The last line of the poem again refers to the effect on the families at home. Each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds, makes me think of a widow closing the blinds or her eyes each day, her husband on her mind as she goes to sleep. A depressing image to end a sad poem, which may also refer to the death of the soldiers themselves. The next poem is Disabled by Wilfred Owen. This poem's purpose is to analyse the treatment and fate of injured war veterans. Its themes are the war veterans, treatment of soldiers and injuries. Its tone is bleak, desperate, isolated, frustrated and regretful. So this poem looks at the effect of the aftermath of war on horrendously injured war veterans and the way they're treated. Stanza 1 presents this disabled soldier as an isolated, lonely man with no hope. He is waiting for dark, where dark means death as well as night time. He is wearing a ghastly suit of grey, which suggests he looks like a corpse and he has long since lost all colour and life from his appearance. This image is referred to again later in the poem. He is legless, sewn short to elbow, a stark description of the fact he's lost his limbs. The voices of play and pleasure cause him pain as they are now a thing of the past for him. The next stanza looks back at this positive past he enjoyed. The words used to take us back in time. The language here is more positive. Glow lamps budded, light blue trees, girls glance lovelier, a world full of colour, happiness and the potential for love. The phrase before he threw away his knees reveals his state of mind. He feels he has discarded his knees and therefore his life like a piece of rubbish into the bin. He is now looked at by girls as though he has some queer disease, so some kind of strange illness, someone to be quarantined and kept away from. He used to be handsome and in demand by an artist who was silly for his face, and here we return to the idea of his colour disappearing. He's lost his colour very far from here, poured it down shell holes till the veins ran dry. This very famous metaphor makes the reader imagine he pours his life into the ground, or put more simply, as he bleeds from his injuries, his life leaks away. Indeed, he feels half his lifetime has lapsed, so in that moment he cut his life expectancy in half. No wonder he seems to be waiting for death. Stanza 4 looks at the reasons he joined the army. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts, that's why, and maybe too to please his Meg, so to look good in uniform and press his girlfriend. The irony of his injuries is that he lied about how old he was. His lie aged 19 years. Owen is criticising the army here for allowing him in. No fears of fear, he was not scared. The alliteration here presents him as cocky. Other reasons for enlisting include jewelled hilts, so expensive looking daggers for his uniform, smart salutes and care of arms, looking after your rifle, leave and pay arrears, holidays and back pay, esprit de corps, the feeling of brotherhood and belonging, drums and cheers, the way crowds will cheer him off to war. Santa Five compares all of these naive reasons for joining up with his situation now. No crowds cheering, just a solemn man who inquired about his soul. 
This suggests people look at him as near death. This man talked to him as if he was a priest reading him his last rites. Stanza 6 deals with his future. He will spend just a few sick years in institutes. Notice the word few, which suggests he will give up on life. He will be forced to live by the rules of others. His life is out of his control, and there is no chance of love or relationships. The women's eyes pass from him to the strong men that were whole. They see him as weak and half a man and not interested. The poem ends with his repeated pleading rhetorical questions which are not answered. Why don't they come? Unfortunately, it seems life and people have forgotten about this soldier. Owen is suggesting that this betrays what they have done for the country and that they deserve better treatment for their sacrifice. The last poem is Icarus All Sorts by Roger McGough. McGough is an English performance poet and broadcaster who writes for children and adults. The period he's writing about is the Cold War. Its purpose is to point out the madness of nuclear war. So the themes are nuclear war, a satire, and the idea that it affects everyone the same. Its tone is humorous, ridiculous and exaggerated, and at times sarcastic. Icarus refers to a Greek myth about a lad with wax wings who ignored a warning about flying too close to the sun. His wings melted and he fell into the sea and drowned. So this poem is in part a warning, and it's a warning to everyone because of the pun in the title on licorice all sorts. It applies to you, whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you're like. The poem opens with a quote from a TV news broadcast describing how a meteorite is said to have landed in New England. No damage is said. This meteorite starts a nuclear World War III. A little bit of heaven refers to the meteorite, but the crazy general who rubbed his hands in glee while grinning uses this as an excuse to push the button to launch the USA's nuclear arsenal. The general is presented as looking for any excuse to do this. McGough uses hyperbole throughout this poem, which is exaggeration, and ridiculous images to make us smile and portray nuclear wars completely crazy. So from every corner of the earth the missiles are launched, an exaggeration. There are missile jams above us because there are no traffic lights in the sky, a ridiculous statement. And he compares the time it takes for us all to die to the time it takes to blow your nose, another silly image. The pace of the poem conveys the speed at which we'll die. The people fell, the mushrooms rose. It's all over in one line, we're all dead, and there are mushroom clouds everywhere. McGough clearly believes that such a situation would be utter stupidity. We are then presented with a series of images of various different people from around the world suffering the same fate. There is a fat lady playing bingo who shouts house as the bombs fall, and a German butcher, an ironic reference to the two world wars which Germany started. The bingo hall moves to various parts of the town as a comical way of describing its obliteration, and Rouse is comedic because it rhymes with house, giving both people the same status. Even the royal family are untouched with Philip and the Queen described in the style of a childish nursery rhyme when through the window flew a bomb, another silly image which is unrealistic. The reference to a toadstool at the end of the stanza refers to the mushroom cloud of nuclear explosions. Moving on, the rich, the poor and civil defence volunteers all die in the blast too. The image of the rich is ironic because they die outside the doors of their expensive bomb shelters and are compared using a simile to drunken carol singers to describe the way they all fall around. The reference to the very last TV guide points out the potential for humans to destroy themselves in a nuclear war, and the defence volunteers are painted using a crazy image, with their tin hats in one hand and their heads in the other, so much for their tin hats protecting them. Even those who warned against nuclear weapons, the campaign for nuclear disarmament supporters, are not saved, but at least they get the last word by scrawling, I told you so, in the dust caused by the devastation. This image is very ironic. McGough, despite all the craziness and silliness, is making a serious point here and criticises governments who build weapons by saying the general should have got the sack. This is just a little bit of an understatement. He finishes the poem with another exaggeration of the 3,768 people who died. But his last words are serious and deserve a line on their own. Would it? Brings the poem to a close with a rhetorical question which contains his clear opinion that we need to campaign against nuclear weapons so that we avoid this fate. Hope the analysis of these six poems has helped. Thanks for watching and please see our other videos for further revision info. Here's wishing you the best of luck.